tri-state area, Michigan, Illinois. Um, and the program is designed to, it's an entrepreneurship program, but it's really about, it's about getting pers a person in that mindset to get them ready to re-enter, to get, get a job. If they start their business, that's great. You do the business plan. Um, so that we have different pathways. They do the program in prison and once they come out, I'm the manager of the, pro of the uh, career re-entry portion. So when they come out, they come out to me or whoever is in that position in the area and has the opportunity to either continue on the entrepreneurship pathway and um, where we have an accelerator program and um, partnerships and, or they can just uh, be one of our alumni and get the support that way. So yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, and if you, if you could share maybe some links or resources in the chat, that would be great for our participants. Yes. And now we'll turn it over to Shafali for the presentation. Thank you. Hi, well, my name is Shafali. I'm an attorney at Wilson Sonsini in the Technology Transactions Group. So I work a lot with commercial contracts and businesses. Um, so we're gonna be giving an overview of business law basics uh, and the considerations that you want to think about when you're getting your business off the ground. So we have a slide that we, we prepared and uh, there's a lot of detail in these slides, probably more than we'll be able to get through today in the, in the time that we have. So we'll be distributing the slides after the fact so that you can read them at your own pace and really capture all the information that's there. There are some helpful links there. So don't worry about writing them down as we're going. Um, you'll get these after the fact so you can have them for your personal files. But if you have any questions on anything that I'm talking about, feel free to drop them directly in the chat and I'll keep an eye there and we can stop and talk about those questions while we're on that topic so that we, I make sure that we have enough time to cover all of that. Uh, so starting here, I'll share my slides and just give me one second. Okay. All right. So um, can everyone see that okay? Yes. All right. Awesome. And I'll just pull up the chat here as well. So I have that. Um, great. So these are the topics that we're going to be covering today. Uh, we'll spend a lot of time on the first one, which is choosing a business entity and deciding which one is the right fit for you. We'll also talk about licensing and permits, uh, considerations with contracts, employment concerns, a bit about IP, and then at the end, there are a few slides about general resources that may be helpful and, and we'll leave those up for you so that you can uh, explore those links after the fact. So choosing a business entity, and you may wonder, why do you need to choose a business entity and how do I choose one? So there are lots of options out there and it really comes down to how much risk you're willing to absorb with respect to your personal assets as opposed to your business assets. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, these are the riskier structures, a sole proprietorship and a general partnership. And this is really what happens if you don't do anything. If you don't form a company or an LLC or a partnership, then you're in this left side of the screen, which is one of the riskier situations to be in. In the middle is a limited partnership. And then on the right-hand side where you have more protection is the limited liability partnership, LLCs, corporations, special purpose corporations, and benefit corps. So we'll go into these in more detail. So consider these three aspects, liability, management and ownership, and taxes. So you want to consider which entity type will best protect your personal assets, you wanna consider which entity type will allow you to own and manage your business in the best way possible. And you also wanna consider which entity type will be the most advantageous to you in terms of taxes and fees. There are a few entity types, and this is a, again, just a brief overview, but we'll be going into each one in detail. So a sole proprietorship is a business in, that is owned and operated by one person. There's no legal separation between the owner and the business itself. So let's say you started selling something out of your home and you didn't put any paperwork in place, you would be operating a sole proprietorship. A general partnership is similar, but it's two or more people that are operating a for-profit business 
as co-owners, and that would be a general partnership, whether or not they have a formal contract in place. And there's again, no legal separation between the co-owners and the business itself. So these first two formats are the most riskiest because whatever your personal assets are, if there are business debts or liabilities, those personal assets could become at risk. Next, we have a limited partnership, which would be either an LP or an LLP. And this is a business structure in which one or more general partners manage the business and the general partner has unlimited liability. And then there are one or more limited partners and those limited partners may invest capital or take a more passive role in the organization. They may not necessarily manage the business and they would have limited liability. LLPs are limited liability partnerships and they are reserved typically for lawyers, accountants, and architects. Next, we have limited liability companies, LLCs. And this is a business entity that's not a partnership and it's separate from its owners and it provides its owners with limited liability for debts and obligations of the business. And it allows for almost unlimited flexibility in terms of organizing your internal operations. So in terms of deciding how many, how much profits each person may be allowed to earn and what voting power may be, what management responsibilities may be, the LLCs offer, offer the greatest flexibility. The owners would be called members as opposed to shareholders. And they would be called shareholders in the context of a corporation. So that's the last one on this list. And that's a business entity that's separate from its owners. The owners are shareholders. They're not personally liable for the debts and obligations of the business. It's like holding, holding shares in Google. You're not necessarily at risk for anything that Google does. You're just simply collecting the profits. And there are two different types of corporations in terms of taxes. There are C-Corps and S-Corps. And we'll get into all of that in more detail. So the sole proprietor is a business that's owned and operated by one person where there's no legal separation between the owner and the business. And the owner simply starts selling their products and services. But you still need to get the licenses and permits that you would for any business. So in terms of liability, because the business and the owner are one and the same, that person is fully liable for the debts and obligations of the business. So it would be extremely important to have liability insurance in place. The owner would have complete control over the management and ownership of the sole proprietorship. And there would be pass through taxation, which means that all of the profits and losses that are realized by the sole proprietorship would pass through to the individual and the individual would only pay taxes once on their personal income tax returns. Taxes would be paid to the city, the state, the federal government, and as per typical, you would have income minus deductions. In California, the self-employment tax rate is 15.3%, and you would it would be broken up by the 12.4% Social Security tax rate and the 2.9% Medicare tax rate. For a general partnership, this is very similar, but it's with two or more people. So it's not just one person running the show, but it's two or more people who are operating a for-profit business as co-owners, whether or not they have a formal contract in place. So if you don't do anything, if you don't put any agreement in place, you're operating a general partnership, which is one of the riskier structures to operate because you have almost all liability for all of the debts and obligations of the business. The owners are jointly liable, but still your personal assets would be at risk and it would be extremely important to have liability insurance in place. In terms of management and ownership, all owners would if you don't agree to something else, the owners would naturally have an equal right to manage the business and an equal right to own the business and the profits that come from it. You would ideally have a partnership agreement which would spell this out in more detail. And then in terms of taxes and fees, it's similar to the sole proprietorship where the in owners receive income from the business directly, it's passed through taxation. So they pay taxes on their income on the federal and state local level as it's passed through the business only one time. Similar to the sole proprietorship, you have city, state, and federal taxes. You have the form 1065, a schedule K-1, and a form 1040, and you would be subject to self-employment taxes. Then you have the limited partnership. Um, this is sort of a, a hybrid situation where you have at least one general partner, and the general partner has unlimited liability. And then you have at least one 
limited partner and the limited partner has limited liability because that limited partner isn't taking a big role in managing the business. So in terms of liability, the general partners are liable for all the debts of the business, but the limited partners would not be. And in terms of management and ownership, only the general partners would have the right to manage the business and they may have greater rights to the ownership and profits that would flow through. And again, this would all be spelled out in a partnership agreement if you wanted it to run a little bit differently than the default. Taxes and fees are also on a pass-through basis because this is again, a partnership. So very similar to what we are seeing in the other slides, you have the city, state and local, city, state and federal taxes. You have your Form 1065, the Schedule K-1, the Form 1040, and your 15.3% self-employment tax. So the key difference between a general partnership and a limited partnership is liability, right? The key partner is that a limited partner in the limited partnership is only putting their cap capital contribution at risk. There's no risk that the limited partner's personal assets, his home, his car, could be seized because of the business debts, obligations, or liabilities. Then we have the LLCs. And here's, so we talked about partnerships and then now we're talking about companies. So this is a limited liability company. This is a business entity that's separate from the owners and it provides its owners with limited liability for debts, obligations of the business. And it allows for almost unlimited flexibility in organizing the internal operations of the LLC. So that could be allocating shares of profits, voting power, managerial responsibilities. The owners are called members. So in terms of legal liability, all the members have their personal assets shielded from the debts and obligations of the LLC. So your personal assets are not at risk. In terms of management and ownership, it would depend on the number of members. You could have a one member LLC or you could have multiple members in the LLC. And if you have multiple members, you would wanna to put together an operating agreement. And in that operating agreement, you could say whether both people or all the persons are going to have an equal say in deciding the direction of the LLC and the, you know, which contracts to enter into and which employees to hire. Or you can say that certain people or certain members will have more rights and responsibilities than others. So you have a lot of flexibility in the operating agreement to say what you want it to say. And the LLC would likely pay taxes on a pass-through basis as well. It can't elect to be taxed as a C-Corp, but likely you would be in a world of pass-through taxation if you went this route. Then you have a corporation. So a corporation is a business entity that is separate from its owners and it provides its owners with limited liability for the debts and obligations of the business. The owners are called shareholders. They're not called members. And a few of the same things to consider. So in terms of liability, same as the LLC, there's limited liability for shareholders, but this is where it's a little different. With the management and ownership, corporate law has really defined roles for shareholders, board of directors, and officers. So there's less flexibility to divvy up the management responsibilities and the profit earning potential of the individual shareholders as compared to an LLC. And you would spell all this out in the bylaws. You would create a type of equity that would be issued to the shareholders and the shareholders would then elect the board of directors and then the board of directors would then hire the officers. So there's much more defined roles and it's really dictated by corporate law and you have to abide by those requirements, which is totally different from the LLC, which is where you just say what you want to say in the operating agreement. So you have a lot more flexibility with an LLC. So because of that, the paperwork is a little bit more complicated with a corporation than with an LLC. And the upside though, is that if you're operating a corporation rather than an LLC, it's going to be a lot easier for you to get outside investors as new owners and to issue share, well, share certificates to those new investors. Whereas with an LLC, you're gonna run into problems holding any type of venture financing or getting financing in general. And with taxes and fees, you can elect to be taxed as an S-Corp, which means that you would have the same pass-through taxation that we've been discussing, or you could elect to be taxed as a C-Corp, which would mean double taxation. And we'll talk a little bit about what double taxation means. C-Corps versus S-Corps, which one is better? It depends. Um, with a C-Corp, you can have unlimited shareholders. It is managed by the board of directors. You have limited liability. It's easy to expand, but you're subject to double taxation. 
within S Corp, there are more restrictions. You can only have a maximum of 100 shareholders. Similarly, it's managed by a board of directors. There's limited liability, but all the shareholders must be U.S. green card holders or U.S. citizens, and they must be actual people, not business entities. And this is why you're going to have trouble as an S Corp or an LLC raising venture capital or holding a formal round of financing because the structure doesn't allow for that sort of ownership potential. And but the upside is that you only have pass through taxation as opposed to double taxation. So when I say double taxation, what does that mean? So a C Corp has double taxation, which means that when the business, when the corporation earns income based on the net income, the company is going to pay taxes once. And then at the end of the day, all the expenses are deducted and the profits are distributed to the shareholders as dividends, then the shareholders pay taxes again. So that's where you get the double taxation. That's different from a pass-through taxation standpoint where the company itself or the partnership itself or the LLC itself doesn't pay the taxes. It all passes through to the individual owners and then you declare those taxes on your personal income tax returns. So this only really matters though if you're planning on declaring dividends. Um, and, and it's very fact specific, whether this is something that you really need to worry about. Oftentimes in the beginning, there really aren't very many profits to, to be concerned about. And so the double taxation issue isn't an immediate concern. And it's nice to be structured as a C-Corp if you think that you're gonna be raising venture capital down the road. So the bottom line is that the tax analysis is a very fact specific. You're going to wanna ask an accountant or a tax attorney about your specific scenario to make sure that you're making the right election. For limited liability, it's, it's super important that you keep your business assets and your personal assets separate. So you would wanna consider getting liability insurance and you would wanna make sure that you're really, you're really documenting everything. You're keeping good records. You're, um, you're maintaining separate bank accounts because there is this concept of piercing the corporate veil and courts have sometimes said, well, if the funds are commingled and it wasn't clear whether a check from a customer was going to the business account versus the personal account, then really if there's a debt that's due, it's all one big account and we can't really make heads or tails of what was personal or what was business. So it's always a good idea from the very outset to keep all your documents, records, accounts separate so that you know that the things that are affecting the business don't affect your personal assets down the line. So important tips to keep in mind for the management structure, you want to keep in mind, you know, clarify the ownership. Who owns what percentage of the company? Will it change over time? And how is that determined? And also, how are the incentives set up? So there's this concept of vesting. And sometimes when an investor, for example, gives money to the company, invests money in the company, they'll expect a certain amount of shares up front. But other times when you're issuing equity to an employee or a new hire or an independent contractor or a co-owner or a co-founder, you may not wanna give all the equity upfront and you can instead have it vest over time, which means that the equity really only is, belongs to the person over time. And it can be based on time, like after a one year anniversary with, your, with the company or a two year anniversary, or it can be based on milestones. So after certain milestones have been met or after the company has opened its second location. So you, you can set that up so that the people who are receiving equity, they're incentivized to stay and to really invest in the business rather than just receiving everything up front and they can leave. Then you also wanna clarify, of course, who does what jobs in the company. And you want to formalize your management relationships. You want to put down on paper who is responsible for decision making in the company, including who has the power to change management. Top management should meet regularly and really there should be a clear process that people know about, you know, what are the expectations? How often are we going to meet? Who's responsible for what? And what do we do if there's a disagreement? There are, so this is a helpful chart. It spans a few slides and it explains the fees and taxes, both the initial fee, the maintenance fees, and also the annual tax requirements for each of the structures. So I'm not going to go over this in detail, but it's a helpful reference point. And you can keep this for your files down the line when you are deciding really which route you want to go in. OK. 
Okay. And again, here's just a helpful breakdown of the entity types, the same information that we've been talking about. You have an LLC, a C Corp, a limited partnership, and an S Corp to decide between. And it really comes down to how many owners or shareholders you envision having, how much liability that you feel comfortable absorbing, and also what's the tax situation, if you're comfortable with the double taxation situation or whether you prefer the pass-through taxation. You want to weigh your options. With a limited partnership, this is generally for specialized professional groups or specific projects like lawyers or real estate or venture funds. For a C-Corp, this generally makes sense if you're going to be receiving investor financing and it's easily scalable. With the LLC, this is a super flexible tax structure and it's really focused on the individuals and you would be able to design your own style within the operating agreement. So that's really attractive. And then lastly, you have the S Corp, which has tax benefits and has a separate corporate life and gives you that limited liability. There is another type of uh, organization that we'll just talk about briefly. It's called a cooperative, and it's a business or organization that's jointly owned and democratically controlled by its members for the purpose of mutual benefits. So California allows a cooperative corporation under the Consumer Cooperative Corporation Law. But there are a few rules. You need to use the term cooperative in the name. Um, you can have zero to unlimited number of members. Uh, there's a one member, one vote requirement. The managers manage, there's limited liability and um, there, you're, it's structured through the laws with formal requirements, including membership, board of directors and meetings. Profits are taxed at the entity level with no pass through taxation. There's no self-employment tax. It must be a democratically controlled organization and it, it cannot be organized to make a profit. It must be primarily to benefit its members and the member benefits need to be distributed based upon how many hours the members are working for the cooperative. And there are fees, a statement of information that you would need to file, but there's no annual filing fee. So, so that's a little bit about cooperatives. They're, they're not super common, but I'll leave this here in case that's something that you've heard about or you wanna research further. Ah, and here we go. Again, the, for the cooperative corporations, there's unlimited owners or members. All members must have one vote. The managers manage, there's limited liability, formalities through law. The profits are taxed only at the entity level. The benefits are distributed based on hours put in and the owners are generally considered employees. So that's it about in choosing which business entity structure that you wanna go with. Um, this is a, a short section about licensing and permits. And no matter what entity you choose, whatever, what entity type you choose, you're going to need to think about local, state, and federal licensing and permit requirements. So at the local level, there could be zoning requirements. There could be a fictitious business name requirement or a DBA that stands for doing business as. That's, um, for example, if you're registered under a certain corporate name, but you want to do business as an alias name, kind of like a nickname. So you could you would file that locally. There are business tax registration certificates, um, other permits and licenses. On the state level, you would need a seller's permit, a business qualification. You would need to comply with withholding insurance and tax requirements. You would need to get a tax EIN number, employer identification number. You would need to get workers' comp insurance and any other licenses. Uh, at the federal level, there are business tax issues and withholding employee tax issues. So you can go here to this website, calgold.ca.gov for a list of required permits that would be for your specific type of business. And, and that's super helpful. Um, next, we'll get into contracts. And I'll, I'll just remind everyone that if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about so far, go ahead and drop them in the chat box. So I, I know, um, that there's interest in, in lingering on a certain topic. Um, I know that we'll be going through a lot of materials, so I definitely wanna make sure that we have time to cover any questions that anybody may have. But next we'll get into contracts. And this is a, a, just a few slides here about what is an enforceable contract and the key considerations that you wanna keep in mind. But um, there is another longer presentation specifically on contracts. So if this is interesting to you and if it's relevant to your business, then go ahead and um, you know let us know and we can distribute the link to that presentation so you can get the full information about the contracts portion specifically. 
So a contract is a promise or a set of promises that is enforceable in court. Um, it can be oral or written, but it is always best practice to put your business contracts in writing. And why is that? It's easier to prove. Um, you can prove, you know, what you said and what they said and what the agreement was. And you, others can review it and it shows a clear intent. So if you go to court and you have to say, this is what we meant, it's way, it's way helpful if you have a written contract that indicates what the agreement was in the beginning when there wasn't any disagreement. So you would want to use a contract in a few situations, obviously with a client or with a customer, also with vendors. So if you have sales contracts for materials or purchase agreements, inventory agreements, storage agreements, transportation agreements, service agreements, with employees, you definitely want to have contracts in place. And these could be offer letters, employment agreements, non-disclosure agreements, or even invention assignment agreements. With independent contractors and subcontractors, you would also want to have a consulting agreement or an advisor agreement in place. Um, and for potential partners, you would want to have a no, non-disclosure agreement in place before you divulge any confidential information or trade secrets. For business entity formation, um, all that we've been talking about, the partnership agreement, the operating agreement, even the bylaws in a sense can be considered contracts and you would definitely want to have those written down. And with capital providers, uh, so if you're going to the bank, if you're doing any sort of financing or angel investing, then you would want to have all your agreements written down. Um, I'm looking at a few questions here. So, um, okay. So there's a request for the link to the full contract resources. So we'll definitely distribute that. And there's a question, what permits do you need from the police department and what businesses fall under fortune tellers? So that, that's, that's interesting. I don't have that information on hand right now, but what I'll say is that the Legal Services for Entrepreneurs runs a clinic and you can, if you have fact specific inquiries like this, you can register for the clinic and, and we, help you figure out answers to these types of specific questions and we can look into what the specific requirements may be for your business. Any information on nonprofits or not-for-profits? So not in this, in this presentation. So a nonprofit would be a 501c3. Um, there are totally different requirements for operating those. You, um, there are many ongoing requirements about reinvesting the profits and not distributing them as dividends. And um, so that, that's sort of a whole different ballpark and they're tax exempt organizations. And in this instance here, we're talking about for-profit businesses. So a little bit different, it, they're not covered by this presentation, but again, if you register for the clinic, I'm sure that we would be able to help further. Okay, back to the slides, um, contract terms. So you would wanna make sure, you know, does the contract clearly describe your obligations, the other party's obligations, the payment terms, the timeframes, ways that you can change or terminate the contract and dispute resolution. What happens when there's a disagreement? How do you resolve that? And what's the liability burden or liability cap? Main question is, can you live with this contract? There are other contract facts that you wanna keep in mind. Not all promises are enforceable as contracts. So just a unilateral promise to give someone something or to do something is not enforceable as a contract. You need to make sure that there's consideration, some sort of quid pro quo. So if, some, if you're gonna give something in exchange for someone giving you something, then that would be an enforceable contract. You can't go to court and enforce a one-way promise or a one-way gift. You need to make sure that the contract is legal. And, and that means that it, it cannot involve illegal activities. If so, the court would find that to be void and you wouldn't be able to enforce the contract. So for example, um, performing services without the proper licenses and permits in place would be considered an illegal activity. So if you don't have those licenses in place and you have made a contract to provide those services, those would be illegal services. So even if somebody didn't pay you, or if there was a disagreement that was separate, you wouldn't be able to go to court and enforce that contract because it wasn't legal. You need to make sure not to misrepresent your facts. You need to, you need to um, modify, and you need to keep in mind that modifying the contract requires a new exchange. So for example, if, if um, 
somebody says that they'll paint your door, but then you ask them to also paint your garage, you're going to need new exchange. You're going to need uh, more consideration, more money, or something else in order for that a modification to the contract to be enforceable. The person who makes the offer for the contract, they can dictate the terms for when the offer expires. So it's always smart to accept the offer in a timely manner. You want to avoid ambiguous terms. You want to make sure to read the contract to see if there are different. And you want to make sure that when you read the contract, does it read exactly the same as you thought when you accepted the offer? Sometimes what's written down in paper doesn't match what the agreement is orally. Let's say you 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 agree that somebody's going to sell you a certain quality tools, but the agreement, the contract doesn't specify that quality. Well, really, it's only what's written in the contract that's going to be enforceable. So if that doesn't actually come through at the quality that they had represented to you, if that's not written down in the contract, you wouldn't be able to enforce that. If the other side, so this is an important point. If the other side doesn't fully perform, but still substantially performs, and it's not a material breach of the contract, it's important that you don't stop performance, otherwise you could be found in breach of the contract. So for example, if somebody, if somebody promises that they're going to give you four books in exchange for $100, but they're only able to give you three books, that could be considered substantial performance and not a material breach. So, so then you, on the other hand, you can't then withhold the entire $100 because then you would be in material breach of the contract yourself. You may negotiate something else with the counterparty and say, okay, maybe 50% or 75% based on the amount of performance that was delivered. But just because the other person has a minor breach doesn't mean that you can completely stop performing the contract. Otherwise they can then enforce the contract against you. One question here on the side. Um, I filed an LLC, but I'm not ready to launch and I regret filing. Is there a way to freeze or put on hold? So um, I would want to look into this further, but my sense is that if you didn't continue paying the annual maintenance fees, you would naturally be put on a freeze or a hold. And so, and then probably you could reactivate that. Maybe there's a small penalty down the line um, to do so. So that's probably the easiest way, especially if you think that the business is still going to be potential down the road, right? So you don't want to dissolve or wind down the business because you think that this is still going to be active down the road. So then in that case, you could just probably abstain from paying the annual filing fees and then and then re, repay those fees. Or maybe you have to do a catch-up amount later on when you're ready to actually start operating. All right, um, tips for a healthy business. You want to use formal contracts with all people you do business with. You want to keep good records, a record keeping system for all payments to and from the system, proof of performing a contract, and you want to document employee performance. So now we're going to shift to employment concerns here. Um, and this is a popular topic, and this is one that people often have a lot of questions about. So, so hiring tips, get everything on paper use offer letters and you want to include whether the employment is at will, whether the compensation is salaried or hourly, what the compensation and benefits are, including vacation and non-disclosure agreements regarding any of the confidential information that the person may be exposed to or um, privy to while they're working with you. You want to create employee handbooks that describe policies for the company and you want to use payroll services. Independent contractors are not employees, and, and this is a major distinction. So independent contractors are not owed benefits, leave, or overtime, but you do own, but, um, you, and you have to specifically get an invention assignment agreement from the independent contractor so that whatever work they do for you becomes owned by the business. Whereas with an employee, the employee's work for you is is owned by the business, but you should still have an agreement in place. And that employee is owed benefits, leave, and overtime. So to qualify as an independent contractor, there's this three-part test. And you need to show that A, the independent contractor is free from the control and direction of the employer. B, that the independent contractor performs work outside of the usual course of the employer's business. 
and C, that the independent contractor is normally engaged in this type of independent trade or business. So for wage and hours considerations, each of these three criteria needs to be met. But for the other, the other issues, each factor is weighted sort of differently and there is a, um, a factual analysis where all the circumstances are weighed together in which a court may decide whether or not the classification as independent contractor versus employee was done correctly. So tips for hiring an independent contractor. Hire the contractor for the specific job. So uh, typically this is project based, you know, will you come write this specific source code or will you come, you know, paint this wall. Um, you want to pay the independent contractor by the job, not on a salary basis. You would not be able to supervise or control or micromanage really how and when and where the independent contractor is working. So you would be able to set some general timelines and say that there's this general agreement to perform this specific job by this date, but generally speaking, independent contractors have a lot of flexibility and freedom to decide whether they're going to work from home or on the weekend or, um, you, you know, how many hours they're going to use and if they're going to um, hire any assistance to help them. Um, do not pay out of pocket expenses. You want to hire for work that's not part of the day to day operation of the business. So it's usually for like discrete projects that the business needs help with and not something that you would typically hire a full time employee for like a like a sales professional like a sales agent would typically be an employee and not an independent contractor type of role. You want to be crystal clear in the agreement that the independent contractor is responsible for their own liability, their own workers' comp, taxes, and benefits. And of course, you want to put the agreement in writing. So it's important to note that the IRS is going after employers who misclassify employees as independent contractors. There are audits that are happening. The Department of Labor is looking into all of this quite frequently. So you definitely want to make sure that you're paying attention to these this guidance and you're thinking about whether somebody truly is an employee or an independent contractor. The minimum wage right now in California is $12 an hour. If you have fewer than or equal to 25 employees, it's $13 an hour. If you have 26 or more employees in SF, it's $15.50 and Oakland is $14.14. .14. You want to check if the, your project is covered by prevailing wage rules and you would want to post on your door or your window or a wall the required minimum wage poster. So importantly, employees cannot waive their or sign away their rights to minimum wage and importantly, tips cannot count towards minimum wage. There's also overtime rules. So if somebody works more than eight hours a day, they would get 1.5 times the hourly rate for each overtime hour. If they work 40, more than 40 hours a week, the same applies. If they work for seven consecutive days, then on the seventh day, they would get 1.5x each hour of overtime work done. If they work more than 12 hours in a day, they would get paid 2x for each hour of overtime that was worked. And if they would work more than eight hours on the seven consecutive days, then they would also be eligible for 2x pay for each overtime hour. For paid sick leave, typically one hour accrues for every 30 hours worked. After the 90th day of employment is typically when sick leave kicks in. Employers with fewer than 10 employees can cap the employee's sick time balance at 40 hours. Um, typically, sick pay will carry over to the next year, but there's a cap. As an alternative to the carryover, you can provide at least 24 hours of sick pay at the top of the beginning of the year. Um, and there, there are some more rules here and some more exceptions. So definitely take a look at these, these links here on the bottom right if this is helpful. For healthcare, um, this is per the SF Healthcare Security Ordinance. Depending on the company's size, employers must spend a minimum amount on healthcare for each employee who works more than 10 hours per week. As long as they make the minimum required expenditures, employers can choose how they spend this money. For example, employers can pay for health insurance or make payments to the city's health benefit program called the city option, or there are some other alternatives and you can learn more at the link down below. For workers comp, California requires all businesses to carry workers compensation insurance for their employees. This can be attained from a licensed insurance company or from the state compensation insurance fund. There are a few exceptions. It benefits both the workers and the employers. For the workers, 
um, they're able to get compensated. Um, and for the employers, you typically have less liability exposure than you would otherwise. If you are firing or laying off or closing down your business, firing employees or laying off employees or closing down your business, you want to make sure that you're really documenting all of this so that you're prepared if any disputes or disagreements arise. So before firing somebody, you want to keep a record of poor performance and you want to also keep a record of informing that employee of poor performance and giving them an opportunity to improve. And you want to have a documented reason for firing them. When, when you do let that person go, you want to pay the final wages on time. You would review the employment agreement to see, for example, if any um, business owned equipment like a computer needs to be returned and to make sure that all of that is signed and buttoned up. Um, you want to remind that person to keep trade secrets and information confidential. You may want to have the employees sign a release saying that they agree not to sue the company or um, any other litigation or even um, not to defame the company. And um, you would also want to have a third party present when you're terminating that employee, just in case there's any disagreement, then there's a third party witness there that can say what happened. For immigration, employers must complete the form I-9 for all employees. They need to file this within three days of beginning employment. You want to keep records for three years after the date of hire or at least one year after employment is terminated, whichever is later. If the employee's work authorization has expired, then the employer needs to update the I-9 when that authorization expires. So, you know, a few tips here. The, the employer can ask generally if the employee applicant has a legal right to work in the United States, but the employer cannot ask about citizenship or green card status. Employers can refuse to allow federal immigration agents to enter non-public areas or inspect employee records without a warrant signed by a judge, a subpoena, or an I-9 notice of inspection. And California employers are required to provide affected employees with notice of an I-9 inspection within 72 hours. There is more information here at these links here. And when in doubt, talk to an immigration attorney. Okay. So our last big section here is to cover IP, um, intellectual properties. So we'll go through a couple here. Intellectual property is a way really to protect your name, your brand, your company information, design or invention through trademarks, which would apply to business names, logos, slogans, copyrights, which would apply to artistic creations or software code, trade secrets, which are company secrets, like a secret recipe, um, and patents, which are inventions. Trademarks are available for your brand, it can be a name, a phrase, a design used to identify the source of goods or services like Mary's Pizza Shack or McDonald's or I'm loving it or the swoosh logo. It can include slogans, logos, or specific colors, scents, or sounds. It is not available for generic or descriptive marks, for example, grocery store or sugar cookies. The protection, um, no one else can use your mark so long as you continue to use it but there are some exceptions for fair use and for naming competitors. For obtaining trademark protection, you would wanna check eligibility. You can conduct a free trademark search here at this website. You can also consider checking for an available domain name at the same time, because you're likely gonna want a website. Registration ranges from $225 to $400 if it's filed online and consult with an attorney if, if you need. Um, the scope and duration of the protection lasts as long as you are paying the registration and, you're, and as long as you're continuing to use the US trademark. Um, to enforce a trademark, you would first send a cease and desist letter, which is essentially informing the person that, they're, that they are infringing your trademark and they should stop. And if they don't stop, then you could pursue litigation. Avoiding trademark infringement. Beware of using trademarked or copyrighted artwork on your webpage, logos, or other materials. Electronic tags on images are placed so that trademark holders can easily track unauthorized uses of their images. So, um, you know, definitely putting an image on your website that you just found on Google wouldn't be um, wouldn't be a safe way to go about doing that. For free artwork, consider using Creative Commons, and we've included some links here that are helpful. Um, you can always use low-cost stock images for your websites. Copyright is available for 
a work of original authorship, for example, a book or a movie, artwork, music, or software code, it's not available for names, titles, short phrases, ideas that have not yet been written, painted, or created. The protection lasts for the life of the creator plus 70 years. There are exceptions for fair use for non-commercial purposes, educational uses, and for small excerpts. The registration can be done online. It's $35 and you can use this website here. Trade secrets are available for confidential financial, business, technical, economic, or engineering information. Um, this can be client lists, recipes, and it's only available as a trade secret if the information is economically valuable because it is secret, if it is not generally known and that is actually a secret, and if your company takes reasonable measures to keep it secret. It's not available for public information. You can protect your trade secrets by making reasonable efforts to keep your information secret. And the great way to do this is by using NDAs or non-disclosure agreements before disclosing any confidential information. Patents are available for new and non-obvious inventions. So machines, processes, medicines, they're not available for obvious inventions or software. Um, protection. You can prevent anyone from practicing or using your invention for 20 years, 15 years for design patents, but you must make your invention public. But note that patent law is extremely complex. And if you're considering filing a patent, consult with an attorney, definitely. Um, there's a question here about trademarks. Trademark, uh, trademark protection lasts as long as you're using it. What's considered a timeless? That's a great question. I don't have that information off the top of my head. Um, I'm sure we could do run a quick search and find out offline. Um, but that's a great question and we can circle back with that answer after the fact. Do contracts have to be notarized? Certain types of contracts need to be notarized. For example, ones that need to be submitted to a courthouse or that need to be verified and um, certain types of contracts like wills or estate plans, but not all contracts need to be notarized, but they do need to be signed. They can be electronically signed by via DocuSign or sign now, but they do need to be signed by both parties. Great questions. Okay, back to patents. So the patent timeline here, I'm not gonna walk through this, but generally the filing fee is between $2,000 to $15,000 and the maintenance fee can range from $3,000 to $7,000. So filing a patent and maintaining the patent it is quite expensive and it's complex. So you definitely wouldn't go about this yourself. You would definitely want a patent attorney to help you through this process. When deciding whether or not to pursue a patent, you wanna consider the costs, the time, the money, the method. The main thing is that you also need to make the method, the invention public. You need to disclose what the invention is and also the cost of litigation to enforce the patent. You want to consider the benefits. Is there a real risk of losing the business from copycats? Does the risk outweigh the costs? And you know, the first inventor to file wins the dispute regarding the patent. So if you do think that somebody else is out there and they're going to file a patent on the same invention, then if they beat you to it, then they would win. So it really depends on whether you think what you have is worth protecting and um, if it's a competitive landscape like that with specifically the invention that you have. The alternative could be to file a provisional application, and that's a much lower cost. You can start the application process to demonstrate that you had the idea first, so that's the first to file. Um, one year to figure out if you would benefit from the patent, so you have some time. You can locate funding for the patent during that time, and you can also market to see if anyone else would be interested in licensing your invention once it's patented. So you can kind of buy a little bit more time if you go the provisional application route. With a trade secret, you just keep it a secret, which again, isn't possible if you're gonna file a patent because you need to specifically disclose what the invention is. Some general tips here in terms of IP branding. Consider your brand's logo and domain name early and file or register for these early on. Be aware of others who may be using your name. Ownership, make sure all your service providers assign what they create to your company. If you don't have an agreement putting that in place, then independent contractors and other service providers may technically own the IP and the work product that you think you hired them to do for your company. Company policies, you need to have clear guidelines on how to use company information and resources. And the internet, protect what is on the company website, especially we talked about the stock images and potential trademark infringement that could be an issue there. 
general considerations, keeping your business out of court, use formal contracts, clients and vendors, employees and independent contractors, potential partners, licensing and assignment of IP. For sample contracts, you can visit this website here. You wanna keep good records of the performance of the contracts and employee performance. And I'm gonna jump here to just a few slides here on resources and again, we're just, we're gonna be distributing this after the fact. So I know we covered a lot of information on a lot of topics and there are a lot of helpful links so that you can dig through them and, and see what's relevant to you. So we're definitely gonna be distributing these slides and you'll have access to all these links and the information so that you can go through everything at your pace. And let us know if you have any other questions and if you'd like to register for a clinic to go through your specific scenarios further. Uh, I have one question here. Uh, as an artist, a DJ, I feel a lack of enforcement power when presenting a contract. Is this feeling justified? So um, I, I would need to know more about your situation, but certainly in terms of presenting a contract, um, each party has an equal right to accept or not or reject a contract. There's offer, acceptance, and consideration, and it depends which party brings their written contract to the table and the other party reviews that form. If you have a contract that you like to use, that's well within your rights. I can say that um, definitely when I've hired vendors for events, vendors often have contracts and that's what they use. And um, that feeling of not feeling confident enough to propose your own contract is certainly you shouldn't feel that way. You should have a written contract. It's good for you and it's good for your customers too. All right, um, we have just a few more minutes. I think there's helpful information in the chat box. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email to all the participants with the resources. Again, if you wanna register for a clinic, we can do that offline. And if you have any more questions, please do email us at lse at lccrsf.org. Thank you, everyone.